We're all creatures of habit and it's incredibly easy to fall into the same rhythms and patterns and do the same things in the same ways again and again. So how does anyone actually come up with new ideas and new ways of doing things? Sure, there are lucky spurts and random bolts of lightning or apples falling from trees, but the most reliable and reproducible way of innovating is through research. If it's your first time here, my name is Jack Wang. I'm an Australian microbiologist and professor and on this channel we talk about science, learning and careers. This video is designed to help me more than anyone else really because the truth is I'm running out of time. I've been invited to give a talk next week about the value of research and the slides are due to the organizers tomorrow morning. Editor Jack here it really was cutting it very close. The first clip you saw was me desperately practicing a talk in my car after dropping my daughter off at daycare the morning of the talk. Hopefully it all made sense on the day. I guess we'll wait and see. It's uh, already pretty late at night right now and the organizers have kindly let me know a huge crowd is turning up there are hundreds of students about to start research for the very first time and it's my job to inspire to motivate to engage the pressure is on this is my attempt at a productivity life hack to write a talk by filming my stream of consciousness brainstorm or brain dump and watching the footage back as a video editor to piece it all together. Writing talks is a creative pursuit and like all creative pursuits, they benefit from having boundaries and restrictions. So I gave myself 30 minutes of real world time to just have a stream of consciousness and see what I could make of it. The fact that this will become a presentation for my day job as well as the video for the channel raises the stakes and makes it public. It forces me to hold myself accountable and just get this done. This is a day in the life of a professor struggling to meet their deadlines. Five strategies to use research to help think outside the box and create brand new ideas. Strategy one, information overload. The first problem we have to overcome when talking about research is that the term research has lost a fair bit of value in the general discourse. Every person with an internet connection is doing their own research and falling down rabbit holes of conspiracy theories that are not valid. Search engines have made it easier than ever to access hundreds of thousands of websites for the simplest key terms. So you should be intimidated by how much you need to read to gain a basic understanding of a new topic. In research, the aim is not to read every single thing, at least not initially. Presumably you're a novice to the field you're researching, so you won't have the knowledge base to assess or rank the relative importance of any one piece of information compared to the rest of it, which in this day and age is an overwhelming amount of facts or figures. Thankfully, academic search engines allow you to not only find peer-reviewed sources that have been validated by experts in that field. Also, you can filter them by things like publication date, number of citations from other peer-reviewed journals, authors, as well as their collaborators. And what I like to do is to find a peer-reviewed review article published in the last two to three years, ideally. A review is usually written by an expert in that field, which attempts to summarize all of the findings in that field. It's like a mini version of a textbook written by someone who really knows everything in the world about that topic. It's a really quick way to get a sense of the scope and breadth of that area and the key problems that people are trying to address in the field or the most promising solutions that have been attempted or the things that have been tried and haven't really worked out. If you conceptualize knowledge and understanding as trying to build a house, a house in your mind, this first review that you're reading is just setting up the foundation. How much space will the house take up and how many stories do you need? What's supposed to go in each room? Once you know the skeletal outline of a topic, you know what you don't know. You can be more intentional about your search strategy and choose different combinations of keywords, or take advantage of Boolean operators and or the minus sign tilde to filter the results that fill specific gaps in your understanding. As you find new information, you'll also need to decide how to process and store it. We've talked about note-taking strategies before on the channel and at this level, I think mind map is most appropriate. Establishing connections between the facts you're finding out is the most important thing when grasping at the edges of a new topic rather than every single little date, fact or detail. In academia, we call this a literature search or a literature review and it can take up to a month to brush up on all the things you need to know for a brand new topic. And the Jack here again, another useful skill that will help is a coherent file management system. I know that sounds super 
super interesting or not. But by the end, you will have read hundreds, if not thousands of documents and knowing where to find a specific reference on short notice needs forward planning. Something like EndNote or other reference management software can help. But what you need to do is to be able to find an obscure piece of information you've already read a long time ago on short notice. I make my students download all their papers into PDFs, rename the files by year, first author's name and keyword so that at a glance, this cataloging tells you what that paper is about. This can help a lot come crunch time, whether it be a deadline for a manuscript or a thesis submission. It doesn't matter what the system actually is, but you do need a system. If you followed these strategies, you should be able to find out enough about any topic to have a solid foundation to build on and specifically to find gaps in the field. Areas where people currently don't have all the answers, which sets you up nicely for strategy two, first-hand experience. Up to this point, all you're doing is reading. You haven't contributed to the field directly, just passively. To come up with new ideas within an existing field requires that you actually go out there and gather some new data that no one else has done so far. You need to come up with a research question, a hypothesis, and design a strategy to collect data that tests your hypothesis. An example from my own work, what types of videos will students watch all the way to the end? I could come up with a working theory for a hypothesis, uh, shorter videos with lots of different visual stimulus on screen. They'll engage students more than longer videos that have the same visual presentation all the way through. What do I need to test this hypothesis? Well, maybe a bank of videos, some short, others longer videos with one or two different types of visual imagery only. The videos are then shown to the class, the bigger the better, and the proof will be in the pudding or the analytics. And it's worth both learning some basic statistics and talking to a statistician about your project design. All of this will help you avoid things like anecdotal findings or confirmation bias. People in general are much more likely to listen to any ideas you have if you have evidence to back it up. And once you have first-hand experience in gathering new data about a topic, there's more weight to what you're saying. Granted, this is a huge leap in complexity from strategy one to strategy two. And this is actually where most students tend to get stuck. Coming up with a research question that no one has asked before is genuinely very hard. Not to mention having the equipment, the skills and the expertise to know how to test any theories you might come up with. This brings us to strategy three, relearning how to learn. In formal schooling and education, the vast majority of assessment is still written exams. Yes, as a teacher, it's possible to write questions that test complex problem solving, but most of them are still testing your ability to remember information. There's a huge advantage if you've got a good memory. In Bloom Taxonomy though, this hierarchy of learning complexity, remembering or memorizing is the lowest or simplest form of learning. You answer the same practice questions again and again, and over time you'll remember it. It's not complex, it just takes a lot of time and effort to beat the forgetting curve. When you're trying to think outside the box and come up with brand new ideas no one has heard of before, this is constructing new knowledge all the way up the top of Bloom's taxonomy. The most complex of all the learning that you can do as an individual. This type of work is unlike anything you've done so far in your entire educational or professional experience. So to actually do research, you need to relearn how to learn and really unlearn many of the habits and behaviors that you've used to succeed or survive up to this point. This is an incredibly hard step to take and in all likelihood, you'll have to rise through these ranks gradually. But if you've used the previous strategies, you already be putting many of these high order skills into action, applying the information you've read towards your own research question, collecting and analyzing new data and using it to address a gap in the field, reevaluating your preconceived notions about a certain idea. All of these are these higher order Bloom's taxonomy skills. On paper, I should have hit a ground running when I started my research career. I had a great GPA, really liked the area I was studying and was willing to put in the work. In all honesty, I was a terrible researcher when I first started. I talked about this on the channel quite a lot because it took me years to realize what I just summarized for you in a few sentences that it's almost impossible to bridge this gap in research training overnight. From being a consumer of knowledge all your life to being a creator of knowledge, innovation, and new ideas. It's hard for everyone. And the only way to figure this out is by using strategy four, finding your tribe or finding your people, finding your support network to help you as you slowly develop these high order research skills. In most universities or colleges, you need to have an official supervisor or mentor before they even let you start doing any research. They may very well be the first and most important professional connection you make in your entire career. 
Your supervisors have navigated this transition from novice to seasoned veteran again and again, but it may not be obvious how you're able to access all of their wisdom right from day one. This then becomes less of a research or intellectual problem, but more of a human resources problem. How often do you need to sit down with your mentor? Is it productive to meet them every week or you have even made enough progress in that time? Does your supervisor even have the time and bandwidth to meet you that regularly. This is where I see a lot of mentoring relationships go wrong. When the supervisor is too helpful at the beginning, walking through everything and anything, always on call 24 seven for the student, but eventually they will run out of time, especially the good supervisors. They're so good that they will be needed elsewhere to do other important things. Then what happens? Have they equipped you with the skills to manage your own research at that point? Or have you just been doing what they've been telling you to do rather than learning how to think for yourself? Your tribe or support network can't just be your supervisor. You need to talk to other students, early career researchers, other people's supervisors as well, maybe an option. Vygotsky's zone of proximal development is a theory that suggests for certain types of learning, you might actually get more from your peers who not that long ago just figured out the solution to the exact problem you're facing right now. Senior supervisors may be too removed from your problems to be that relatable or helpful in the moment. So you should recognize the importance of connecting with your peers as part of your research training. Despite everyone's best intentions, there is a limit to how much other people can help you figure out how to become an independent thinker and create new ideas. Which brings me to strategy five, embrace the imposter. The imposter syndrome is an insidious problem that affects all social and professional settings you can think of. We're all secretly doubting whether or not we belong. We're not good enough, capable enough, or perhaps just not cut out for this. Yes, the imposter syndrome happens everywhere, but you have no idea how rampant it is in the research and innovation sector. Maybe it's not surprising given how complex research training can be, how long it takes to break free from your old ways of thinking in order to create new ideas. We're getting better at identifying the problem, but still no closer to a solution. I see researchers all around me every day filled with insecurity, anxiety, and the feeling that at any moment they'll be outed as a fraud. I don't think it's ever going to go away, especially in super competitive fields. So let me pose an alternative. Don't ask yourself if you're an imposter. Know that you're an imposter. In fact, we all are. Revel in your imposter status. Don't run away from it. So what if you're an imposter? There is a lot of value in alternative viewpoints and perspectives and experiences. In many industries, the embittered insider has lost perspective. They have tunnel vision, they're swayed by agendas, and they're not asking the right questions. I've been blessed meeting many wonderful mentors throughout my whole career, and it's interesting that the ones I've learned the most from in the shortest amount of time are outside my immediate discipline. When they know enough about the parameters of my problem to offer real tangible solutions without being clouded by hidden agendas or internal politicking, their perspectives have arguably even more value. Your perspective from the outside looking in also has value. It's uh, getting close to midnight now, so I think that's enough stream of consciousness for me to craft into something sensible for the talk. <laughs> like most of my videos are a little longer than necessary, but I think I got it. The actual talk on the day is only 10 minutes, so I need to be editing myself all the way up until the last minute. Hopefully you found something of interest, learned something about research, or maybe you'd like to try this productivity hack for yourself. Raise the stakes, document, and make the process public. Hopefully I'll pull it all together in time. Good afternoon everyone, it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, giving the Summer Research Welcome in 2022 and talking about the real value of research.